Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 811 of the Juice Box Podcast. On today's show, I'll be speaking with Ben Shabbat. Ben's been a type 1 diabetic for a very long time, and he's also a licensed professional counselor. So you know how this goes. It turns into uh, me being therapized by, a, by Ben. But we talk about stuff that's interesting to you along the way. You get the podcast by now, right? While you're listening today, please remember that nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your healthcare plan or becoming bold with insulin. If you are a type 1 like Ben, or you're the caregiver of a type 1 like me, go to t1dexchange.org forward slash juicebox, join the registry, and take the survey. The survey will take you fewer than 10 minutes. It is completely HIPAA compliant. It is absolutely anonymous, and it helps move diabetes research forward. It does. It seriously does. And you will you are the reason. Your survey answers move research forward. And you never have to leave your house. You can do a great thing right from wherever you're sitting right now. T1DExchange.org forward slash juice box. Today's episode of the Juice Box podcast is sponsored by AG1 from Athletic Greens. I take AG1 every day and you could as well. Athleticgreens.com forward slash juice box. You looking for a green drink that has good stuff in it and tastes good too? Well, then AG1 is what you're looking for. The podcast is also sponsored today. The podcast is also sponsored today by my favorite type one diabetes organization, Touched by Type One. Head over now and find them on Facebook and Instagram and at touchedbytype1.org. This show is sponsored today by the glucagon that my daughter carries, Gvoke Hypopen. Find out more at gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. My name is Ben Shabbat, and I'm a mental health therapist. I work with um, children and adolescents and adults from all walks of life, um, not just those with diabetes. Um, but several of my clients do have diabetes, both type 1 and type 2. Um, but I personally am especially familiar with type 1 diabetes because I've had it pretty much my whole life. Um, I was diagnosed at a young age. And so having grown up with type 1 diabetes, I understand firsthand how stressful and challenging and demanding it is to manage. Yeah. Um, so as a therapist, I'm able to kind of combine my knowledge of diabetes and my training in psychotherapy to help clients overcome challenges and gain insight, gain perspective, um, and to help them realize their goals so that they can live a, a more fulfilling and meaningful life. Yeah. How old were you, Ben, when you were diagnosed? So I was diagnosed at a really young age, um, when I was, I think two or three. It's funny that you, um, you kind of um, almost don't, to, isn't it funny? You kind of almost don't know it's been so long, right? It's been so long and yeah. it's not, uh, you know, all that time gets kind of blended together. And, sure. um, so I don't remember so well the actual time of diagnosis because I was so young. Mm -hmm. Um, do you guys, do you, do you and your, so let me ask a couple of questions, your parents together. My parents are not together, okay. no, did but they you, were at that time. They were at that time. You grew up with two parents is, I guess, my question. Yes. Yeah. It, it, did you not talk about diabetes very much? Oh, no. We talked about it all the time. Um, it's, I mean, as you know, your your daughter's got it, and she was diagnosed young too, right? Two years old. Yeah, yeah. So right right around the same time as me. Uh -huh. um, you can't really not talk about it. It's such a – it's so intricately intertwined in every aspect of your life mm -hmm. that um, – yeah, we talked about diabetes all the time. A, a lot of it um, was, you know, how to manage it. Um, and then obviously, as I got older, understanding what, what diabetes, how, you know, what, what potentially causes it and, um, you know, what all the implications are. Um, and then as I got older, I started getting more interested in the mental health aspect of it and, um, and how to handle that and through that, how to help other people with that. And so, gotcha. um, yeah, it was a constant topic of conversation to answer your question. Interesting. As I'm sure it is in your house. There are times I, so we try to, I mean, we try to tackle it when it needs to be tackled and ignore it when it's, it's not, you know, it's not looking for attention. It's almost like a, 
it's almost like a tantruming to- toddler at some points, right? Like you're like, oh, it, it, it's not going to stop. We'll help it. Uh, and then other times you just you sort of don't want to be bothered. I just made it sound like I don't want to be bothered with toddlers. So I, I, did, I used a bad uh, analogy. <laughs> but um, but I was just trying to get out like because, you know, because you said like two or three in there. Like I just didn't know if maybe it was one of those things. There are a lot of families that just don't talk about it, you know, and so that that was my that was my my initial. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. I think um, I think two things. One, type one diabetes runs in my family, oh. so um, there was a lot of information to talk about and um, and to relate it to, um, and so it wasn't like an unfamiliar conversation even from the start. Mm-hmm. Um, on my mom's side of the family, there's type one diabetes, and so. Um, and on top of that, I think my family also just talks about a lot of things in general. Yeah. Um, no, not particularly um, shocking when you had type one, your mom was probably like, and here it is. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. There was no, not too much confusion as maybe there would be um, in families that don't have type right. one diabetes. Um, so it was recognized pretty quickly. My mom was suspicious of it as soon as I was, uh, you know, drinking a lot of water, using the bathroom, you know, frequently throughout the day. Yeah. Um, sure enough, type one diabetes. Do you have any other autoimmune issues? No. No, I don't. Do they run in your family? Celiac, thyroid, stuff like that? Um, You know, I don't think they do. Okay. I don't think other auto, you know, I guess eczema, you know, mild eczema maybe mm-hmm. um, is, is autoimmune, but um, nothing too severe like type 1 diabetes. Right. Okay. All right. Well, yeah. uh, that's interesting. So you're, um, you're actually an LPC, is that right? That's a licensed professional counselor? Exactly. How do yep. you how do you come to want to do that? So um, I'm also a school psychologist, um, and so you know, growing up with diabetes because it was such um, a frequent conversation in my house, and um, I've always been interested in psychology. And uh, kind of like what I mentioned in the beginning, I think that I, it was a, a good career path for me because I was able to combine those two um, those two aspects of my life. Okay. Um, but in general, you know, I work with all clients, not just those with type 1 diabetes. I've always been really interested in psychology and behavior and what causes people to act and behave the ways they do um, and how to shape behavior. Um, and so I, um, I've i always been kind of fascinated by the, the field of psychology in general. Um, and, and then um, I think the, I became a school psychologist, so working with um, students of all ages. And uh, right now I work mostly with high school students. Mm-hmm. Um, but then as an LPC, I w- I'm able to also work with adults, which is, which is, uh, a, a really neat thing. And so, um, I'm really passionate about the work. Like I said, I find it very interesting. Um, I enjoy what I do. And so, um, I think it, it, it helps me be, uh, a, a successful therapist. Yeah. You're breaking up a little bit, Ben, but, um, I was going to say that, uh, I, I love, I don't know if I, I don't know how to describe what I find interesting about people. It's, It's almost the idea of like, you know, what is a conscious decision and what is a direction that you move in that you are almost powerless to impact? You're like, what's the difference between the things you know are happening that you can impact and things that just happen? Um, And then I've spoken to, I mean, honestly, I'm coming up on a thousand people now, like in, in these interviews, mostly people with type one or people who, you know, love somebody with it. And it's just, it's fascinating to see how one person can be, you know, uh, stricken with a, a set of circumstances and they so just gracefully handle it. And then another person can get the same set of circumstances and it runs them over. And it's just like, I'm, I'm endlessly fascinated about like, why does, why does one person, you know, what is it about one person? Cause it's not, it's not a fault. Like that's what I've, I've mainly noticed is that people who do well, you know, quote unquote, with their management and people who don't do well, they they don't normally have any different level of effort. Like some people just have better tools or better understanding and some people don't. And they put in the, I actually find that people who struggle end up putting in more effort than people who don't struggle a lot of the times. Um, but you know what I mean? Like, what is it about yeah. the way your brain's wired or how you grew up or a combination of those things that lead you to, um, I don't know, just uh, like leads you to have different reactions to different situations? Yeah, it's. I mean, that's a fascinating question. Um, I wish I had a, 
you know, a sure answer for that. Sure enough. Um, you're, you're talking about resiliency and whether that's kind of inborn or, or um, nurtured and, um, or, or where the overlap is there. Cause you're right. So two people can experience the exact same situation and, and one of them seems to handle it, you know, um, very easily and, and is coping effectively. And another person is, you know, can be traumatized by the same situation. Um, so, you know, my guess would be there's a biological factor there. Um, but, I, but I also feel like a lot of it has to do with how um, that situation specifically and other situations, um, stress inducing situations have, have played out in your life, you know, because every situation you're going to have a lot of associations with it. And um, if stressful events um, are not handled adequately, uh, whatever that means for you um, and the way that you've experienced them, then I think those situations are going to cause a lot more stress. And, um, you know, how does like diabetes, for example, that doesn't just impact the person who um, who has diabetes, the individual with the disease that impacts everyone around them and also every um, aspect of their life, every environment they find themselves in. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, part of it is going to be how does how do the people around me handle it, right? Yeah. How do my parents deal with it? How do my friends deal with it? Um, how has this impacted me in school? Um, right. And uh, my reputation there and at work and et cetera, and my relationships. And so it really seeps into every aspect of a person's life. And all of those things combined, I think, um, impact how you, how you handle it, uh, whether you're handling it um, you know, adequately and cope effectively or or whether or not it's causing a lot of stress and, um, and you need to do things and try to, uh, you know, implement some new strategies in your life. Yeah. I'm, I, again, I'm sorry, you, you break up right at the end when you're talking, I don't know why that is, but, um, oh, weird. Um, Can you hear me right now. Yeah, you're fine. And then all of a sudden in longer sentences, it, it's, it's almost like we're asking too much of the internet. It's like, I'm tired. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, are you on your, are you on a phone? No, I'm on my computer. On your computer is it Wi-Fi or is it wired? It is Wi-Fi. Yeah, yeah that might be it. But um, I was going to say that I've been thinking recently uh, a fair amount about the idea that if you just took a baby, a, a brand new baby, and set it down in my house, or you took that same baby and walked across the street and set it down in a different house, that that baby would have a a, a, a profoundly different life depending on on where it is almost, almost as if to say, if a, a, a deer is born in the woods and it's pointing North, it'll have a different existence than if it was born and it was pointing South, yep. uh, you know, just real. And I don't think people, I don't think that's something people think about generally. It's a big idea, right? And it makes it seem like you're not you and you don't have um, agency over yourself. But I think to a large degree, we don't. And then we end up being who we are every day. And then in that day, you need to make a decision and you can only make it based on who you are and what you've seen before and try to put yourself in positions that are of your making instead of, you know, instead of, of the making of the fact that you were pointing South or North when you were born. And, and, and I, I think that once people understand that they're a mix of those things, it becomes much easier for them to, to live, to get, to get through, you know? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I absolutely am a, am a believer in free will and, um, you know, determining the course of your life. Um, of course. And it's, uh, again, it goes back to the nature nurture, um, discussion that we were just having. Right. Um, yeah. Two kids, you, you know, you probably find, find fascinating some of these twin studies. I don't know how much in psychology you've read, um, but they do a lot of studies with identical twins growing up in different environments. And it's fascinating both how similar they they remain to each other, mm -hmm. despite having never met each other and growing up in different houses, um, but also the differences. And so I think that points to when you're talking about development and um, outcomes for people, you're you're looking both at a, at a biological component and an environmental component and, and a major overlap between those things, yeah, right? Because yeah. it's about how your biology reacts to the environment that you're in. Yeah. Uh, it's so much I about how you're been, wired, but then after that, it's a lot about how your wiring responds to impulses that come from the outside. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's like, you know, baking, it's like, you know, baking bread in the oven, you know, what, what contributes to the bread? Is it the ingredients or is it the heat of the oven? Right. You know, and it's, uh, it's, well, it's both. It's, how, it's right. how the heat impacts the ingredients. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And, and so, so uh, applying that to your work, I mean, even in a, in a school setting, right. You don't see people until they've acknowledged that they're struggling. Right. So, um, definitely in, in private practice, that's the case because people have to seek you out. So, so at, at a base level, they've identified that they want some help for themselves. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, in schools, um, it's not always like that because sometimes a person can, um, whether it be a, a teacher, a parent, um, somebody, somebody else can refer a student to you. So sure. the student that doesn't necessarily um, at the start recognize that there's an issue or see their behavior as a problem or. Um, but someone sees it. Someone sees yeah. it. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So um, isn't it? So that's. It, the approach there is is uh, going to be a little bit different um, because you first you know you got to kind of start by of course rapport building but then um, you know reflecting on the behavior and, mm -hmm. and helping them see whether or not it's helping them achieve their goals and getting them to be where they want to be and be the type of person that they want to be right. um, or if it's if it's leading them astray. How much of psychology is maybe it's all of it is based in societal norms and expectations. Right. Because let, let me make just I'll make a wild like distinction. If I was bipolar and mm -hmm. I I I could live my life and be bipolar, I'd probably run into violence or assault at some point. I'd likely mm -hmm. die sooner. I'd likely seek out probably I'd probably become a drug addict, but I would live a life that would come to a natural end. And so yeah. when when you see a person who's that is their their reality. Like I'm trying to use a big reality for a second. The idea of helping them is really to put them inside of a societal norm. Is that right? Yeah. A hundred percent. Um, and I think you had a, did you have a guest the other day? I think that was talking about um, something along these lines, if I remember correctly, but you're talking about, yeah, a kind of evolutionary <laughs> psychology. Um, so, so a lot of the things that we consider to be problematic in today's day and age were advantageous at some point throughout sure. human history. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, like and being so, able to grab somebody and smash their head into a rock. Like like and yeah, exactly. Right, which exactly. Would, would be considered murderous now, maybe 150 years ago would have been considered a great way to stay alive. Absolutely. Like that or kind something of you think about things like ADHD, which is very prevalent these days. Um, you know, there's advantages to being very vigilant and um and paying attention to things happening around you all the time, you know, sure. does it, does it bode well for somebody who has to sit in a math class and study the textbook? You know, no, but, um, when you're looking out, looking through the history of, of humans, um, yeah, it, it does, you know, for it's, it's advantageous for some people in your group or your tribe to be, you know, not so focused on, you know, the rocks in front of them, but to be paying attention to, you know, potential threats on the horizon and, yeah. and things like that, you know, ha having their head always on the swivel can be, can, um, can have some major advantages. And right. so, yeah, you always have to look at things in the context of, of the society you're living in, of course. Yeah. And then when it comes to personal safety, it's really is about our, it, it's, it's about us being evolved because when we see a person struggling, generally speaking, society wants to help that person. Mm -hmm. If I always use like an ant hill as an example, but if an ant is struggling, you know, if, if an ant has one of its legs cut off, the, the rest of the hill doesn't go, Oh no, look what happened to bill. Let's get him a crutch. Like they're yeah. like, they, you know, they, they walk right past bill because bill's done now. And uh -huh. obviously that doesn't work. Like I, I'm not, I'm trying to be clear. I'm trying to play both sides of this, Ben, but I, I would not yeah. abandon somebody, right? Like I'm of the idea that we would help, but, yeah. but all of a sudden you take this person who might be on a path that is for the most part, not correctable, like back to whatever you think normal is. And then you're just jamming their round peg into a square hole for their entire existence. And I'm not saying that maybe that's not valuable, but I've spoken to bipolar people. You, yeah. you know what I mean? And when they're not in the middle of a of an episode, I don't know what you would actually call it. I'm not good with the specifics of it. There's just lovely people like everybody else. And then, oh, yeah. you know what I mean? And then suddenly they're... And so now when you boil this idea down into not so big examples, right? Um, and, and you start thinking about people who have uh, medication needs as an example. Like... You you have an illness or a thing that doesn't work in your body, and it's a, it's it, it's going to happen forever, right? This is not going to go away. And they hand you a pill or a shot or something, and they say, 
do this like this. It's going to make you healthier and extend your life. There mm -hmm. are so many people who don't do it. Yeah. Right. Right. And, and then they just accept that their life isn't going to be, I guess what they had hoped, you know, what, what they were promised on day one, you know, quote unquote promised on day one. And some people are okay with it. And some people aren't. And, and the people who aren't are, are, are fastidious about like, you know, taking care of themselves and, and doing everything that they need to do. And then the people who don't, they don't seem to care. Now where the line gets blurred to me is that in the case of blood sugar, if your blood sugar gets so high, you can't make good decisions anymore. So, mm -hmm. so if you are, you know, you miss your insulin for a, an afternoon that turns into a day that turns into a 350 blood sugar. And now you're not quite thinking clearly you know, mm -hmm. if someone kind of helped you and brought you back down to baseline again, would you make a better decision the second time? Like, I'm just, I don't know. I think there's so much more than the way we think about it when, when people look at it day to day. So when people come to you using diabetes as an example, mm -hmm. is it mostly or mainly about being burned out? Givoke Hypopen has no visible needle and is a premixed auto-injector of glucagon for treatment of very low blood sugar in adults and kids with diabetes ages 2 and above. Find out more. Go to gvoglucagon.com forward slash juice box. Gvoke shouldn't be used in patients with insulinoma or pheochromocytoma. Visit gvoglucagon.com slash risk. My journey to finding a good green drink was not easy. But it did end when I found AG1 from Athletic Greens. The first drink I tried was um, uh, was nauseating. It made my stomach very uh, angibus and don't know if you know the word, but it was upset. And uh, then after that, I tried another one that was like, this stuff's really good. Like, you know, I overpaid for it. And I was like, all right. And uh, it did not taste good either. I uh, So the first one made my tummy upset and the second one made my mouth upset. AG1 makes my tummy happy and my mouth happy and my body happy. I take AG1 every morning. It's super easy to do. Some water, a scoop, shake, 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 right down. What's in the stuff? Well, with one delicious scoop of AG1, you are absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food sourced ingredients, probiotics, and adaptogens. And these are going to help you to start your day off right. Why do I personally take AG1? It's because my diet's a little shaky sometimes, and I want to make sure I'm getting the things into my body that I need, and AG1 helps me with that. Athletic Greens is a climate-neutral certified company, and in 2020, they purchased carbon credits that support projects protecting old-growth rainforests. AG1 will cost you less than $3 a day, and when you're investing in your help, that's just not bad. It's lifestyle-friendly, doesn't matter if you're eating keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free, and... It contains less than one gram of sugar. There's no GMOs, no nasty chemicals, or artificial anything. Athleticgreens.com forward slash juice box. Head over there now, and Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs of AG1 along with your first purchase. That's all you have to do. Athleticgreens.com forward slash juice box. There are links in the show notes of your podcast player to AG1, Givo Kypo Pen, Touched by Type 1, and all of the sponsors. If you can't find that for some reason, they're also at juiceboxpodcast.com. I'm telling you this because when you click on my links or type them into a browser, you're supporting the show and helping to keep it free and plentiful. So thank you very much for taking that extra step. I'm going to get you back to my conversation with Ben now. It actually picks up, a, gets a lot of enthusiasm as it goes on. It's interesting how it grows. mostly or mainly about being burned out or feeling cheated by life or something in that space? Yeah. I mean, that's a, yeah, it's a great question. There's a lot embedded in, in that, uh, in everything you just said. Um, I think when it comes to mental health related to diabetes, I experience most clients who are, um, who are dealing with very high levels of stress. Yeah. Diabetes burnout, um, because it is a 24, you know, it's a 24 seven, um, disease. And so, um, you see a lot of depression, a lot of anxiety, 
um, having a low sense of control over their lives, a lot of eating disorders, body image issues, right. um, you know, feeling defeated. Um, there's also a lack of, uh, you know, some people struggle with the lack of independence because they feel so dependent on, on the people around them and, um, and the insulin itself, you know, to keep them alive. Um, and they're, they're putting excessive restrictions on their life. Um, and, and, and some people are, I get frustrated because they don't recognize the effort that's that other people don't recognize the effort that is required by them to manage their diabetes. Um, cause it takes so much discipline in, in the mind and body to do it successfully. Can we pick, uh, can we pick through that for a second? Cause that one, yeah. fa- that one always fascinates me. The, yeah. um, the drive, the desire, the almost like pathological need to make sure that everyone else understands how hard this is. What does that come right. from? Well, you, I mean, it, why does it matter if every, or anybody else understands that your life is hard? I guess is my question. Well, you know what? I think like any, any circumstance in your life, if you are very stressed about something and other people don't recognize it, there can be an impasse there, mm-hmm. right? Um, you imagine in a relationship, um, with a spouse or um, within a family or coworkers, if you are if you are dealing with something very stressful, that's one of the reasons that therapy is, is so effective because somebody is is there hearing you, witnessing it, um, uh, you know, you know, bearing witness to everything that you are struggling with, and so you got to get it out. You got to you have to tell somebody. It has to be recognized and acknowledged. Otherwise, you're sitting there and and dealing with it all by yourself, and um, and that can be. It's very stressful. Mad, it's That's maddening. Funny. Yeah, yeah. But but I'm saying, listen, Ben, I'm asking you a question you don't know the answer to because I think it makes good conversation and I am generally interested yeah. in it. But like, why does it matter if anybody else knows? Like, like why? I mean, if, if you, you know, know why, tell, why, you know what I, I mean? Think, yeah. What do you think? Yeah. Because humans are social creatures and we're not designed to bear things by ourselves, to bear burdens by ourselves. Um and so I think that when you talk with people, so, so it, it meets a very central human need to be able to share your experiences sure. and, um, and get, get help. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it is, it's imperative that you feel like you can be helped into it, it, your sense of security um, and safety. Yeah. And so when you are dealing with something, you know, diabetes, you got to think about it like this with diabetes, as you know, from your daughter, every Every now, um, Scott, you don't have diabetes, do you? Uh, correct, I do not. Okay, so every but you know from your daughter, every decision you make with diabetes is a high stakes decision. We're not talking about you know, I, and I think people that don't have diabetes or have somebody in their family with diabetes, sometimes they equate it to maybe like um, health, you know, trying to live more more healthfully, you know, making health conscious decisions. So I'll oh, just eat this instead of this, or do this instead of this. Um, your life is, is somewhat on the line with every decision that you make, right? A little bit too much in- insulin can be catastrophic. You know, eat, eating too much sugar can be catastrophic. Exercising too much or too little can be catastrophic. And that takes a major toll, um, especially when you're trying to do it right. And that's kind of the, the irony in it. So, some people do go through the burnout and they just stop caring. Um, they stop putting effort in, but, right. um, and that has its own absolutely set of issues, um, both for physical and mental health. But, um, is you know, that, when you, when you try to try to take control over your diabetes, then you start to realize that every decision that you're thinking about all the time is very impactful and, mm-hmm. and high stakes. Is that, um, you use the word giving up, right? So, um, I heard you right, right. You said like they, they can get burned up, burned out and give yeah. up. Is that the modern equivalent do you think of just like the lay down and die while you're trying to cross the country for the first time or you're on a ship and everybody's sick and you just like ah screw it you just jump in the ocean you're like "Ah, i'm not doing this is that mean do you think that that's the modern version of this it is and it isn't i mean you know all all the stress of living with diabetes all all the effort all the planning all the calculating all the inevitable failures um you know, can be too much for people and, and they get so drained that they want to give up. But, um, and, and with diabetes, it's, it's not something where you can just see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and, and so the thought of having to manage the situation forever can be so overwhelming. And that's when you see a lot of the burnout, but you know, burnout, when, when you experience burnout and we say, give up, you know, like, I'm not going to do this anymore. Well, that, ju- that might mean for some people, they're just not going to take their insulin anymore. Right. Right. 
But then the problem doesn't just go away. Um, it's not like, you know, I'm not going to diet anymore because you feel terrible, as I'm sure you know from mm -hmm. your daughter. Um, when you stop taking insulin, when your blood sugars are, are very high all the time or, or swinging or chaotic, um, you can't just forget about it. There's really no way to just give up without feeling horrible. Well, that's that's sort of my point. Like you, you can't give up because it just puts you in a different horrible situation. Exactly. Yeah, you're trading you're trading one thing for another and they're exactly the same thing. And and some people don't have give up in them at all. So can it be taught? Like because I my assumption is here's a good example. I'm adopted, okay? So I'm not genetically linked to my parents at all. My mom is 80 now. About 6 year 6 months ago, we we thought for sure she was going to die. And we took her to doctors and doctors till somebody figured out what was wrong with her. My mom had cancer, just so much cancer. And she had to have a full hysterectomy, a full hysterectomy at 79 years old. The mm -hmm. next day, as I talked to her on the phone, I said, mom, how's the pain? She goes, oh, it's good. Not bad. She'd just been cut like, you know, from her chest to her belly, you, you know, and opened up. They took out her insides, threw them away, it fixed a hernia while they were in there, did all these other things. As I'm talking to my mom and she says there's no pain, I joke and say, they got you on the good stuff, mom. She goes, no, I'm taking Tylenol and Advil. And I'm like, what's this now? My mom's taking over-the-counter medications for pain after a surgery where she was cut about a foot and a half like through her belly. Two, yeah. day, two days later, she's up walking around. They stick her into chemo, which is terrible. And she just soldiers forward as if there is no other option. And six months later, I'm actually, I don't know if I've ever said this on here. My mom was uh, pronounced to be in remission, um, which is an amazing thing. And Ben, the next day after the, that she was put, she was told she was in remission, she got COVID. And four days after that, she called me up. And she's like, I'm done with this COVID. I feel fine. I got to get out of here. And, you know, then they kept her for 20 days because of some state law in this COVID wing. And she just pushes through that. And I have that. I have that. Like you come get me, Ben, if it goes bad, because I'm not going down. And I can't yeah. and I can't tell you why. I don't well, know why it, that's my reaction. Because life is hard. My uh, my daughter has type one diabetes. She's got a thyroid condition. My wife has a thyroid condition. My son has Hashimoto's. Um, you know, I, I just had a knee surgery. My back hurts all the time. Blah, blah, blah. I get up every morning as hopeful as a newborn bird, and I don't know why. That that is fantastic. I mean, I'd love to, I'd, I'd love to know why. Yeah, right. Um, because why? Because I, it's why I ask the question all the time. Because yeah. couldn't that be taught to someone else? Because I think it was taught to me. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, I don't know. You know, you you uh, you saw that uh, example for you every day with your mom. It sounds like you guys have high resilience. My guess is that you probably have low levels of depression in in your household, right? Well, for me, I'm like I, I don't. I don't understand, like, I can't wrap my head personally around depression at all. Like, I don't know uh -huh. that other people in my family don't get, feel it sometimes. But for me personally, I just have this, everything seems so obvious to me. Yeah. Something happens, you order it. I think uh, I talk about it sometimes. Like, I, I somebody told me one time to think like a, an astronaut. Like, everything's trying to kill you. Order it in the, you know, it, it, by importance and take care of the first thing that's trying to get you and then get the second thing. And I just think that I don't even think about um, I don't even think about things like, oh, I want to go on vacation or I want to do this. Like I'm happy in my work. I'm happy with my family. I don't see life as this thing that owes me something or that it's going to yeah. pay me back bigger. I don't have any big hopes for it. I don't think I'm going to become the grand poobah at the end or something like yeah. that. Like I just yeah. want to be around my family and do the things we're supposed to do. That I mean, that's fantastic. That's that's really where you want to get that's where you want to be where you are you know i think i think you are obviously a go-getter you have high resilience um and you you have a passion for life and i and i think what you said you know is kind of telling you don't think that anybody owes you anything and that's fantastic because to me that means that you don't have a lot of shame see when people feel very ashamed about themselves or mm -hmm. or where they come from or something about um, an aspect of themselves and you feel a lot of shame, then you start to feel like the world owes you something. Right. Like you, 
this is unfair to you. Um, and so, yeah, it's like the opposite of guilt. See, when you feel guilty, guilt and shame kind of go together. When you feel guilty, you feel like you owe, you owe the world, you owe somebody else. Like you've done, you've done something and now you owe to other people. Mm-hmm. When you feel ashamed, you feel like the world owes you something. Really? What's right? the Did function? You, so, yeah. so Ben, I understand if I'm guilty, I feel like I owe that I get, like I have something I don't deserve. I should give it back or something like that. It's actually, uh, the very be- beginning years of the podcast and even the blog I wrote before that, I did feel like that. Like when I realized that my thing helped people, I felt guilty for not helping more people. So one of the reasons oh. I think I've grown the podcast so big was to get rid of that feeling, you know, because I knew something about diabetes that other people didn't know. And it was impacting them so it horribly. And I just thought it's sure. not fair that they don't know this it's my fault if I don't find them to tell them. But I've given, th- I gave that away. And I think that I gave that away just by making it so big that it's hard to, it's hard to ignore that it, that it reaches a lot of people. Right. But yeah. th- I don't understand the shame part. Like shame makes me feel owed. How can you explain how that happens? Sure. Um, well, so there is, um, Basically, I think it boils down to the fact that sh- when when you're ashamed of something, then you feel like um, something was done to you. And okay. so it's not fair and you have to hide it away. And um, and so so then you're owed something. It's kind of just the, it's it's the way that um, we, we try to balance it out. Our, our brains try to balance out that that phenomenon. It's um, so owed in the let me see if I understand. So owed in the sense that something happened to me, I'm ashamed of it. If mm-hmm. some, if if this thing would have just gone differently, I wouldn't feel like this. I'm owed a better chance at this, a better shot than I was given. Is that right? Exactly. OK, exactly. Exactly. OK, well, that's yes. interesting. Yeah. And so um, and so, right, even though those two things, the guilt and shame go together, mm-hmm. the the way they impact the person and the way they manifest are very different. And so, um, you know, you see people who have a lot of shame oftentimes that, um, they, they can display narcissistic personality traits, right? So I, I get everything I'm owed everything. I'm, I can take, I can take, I can take because something was done. That's so wrong to me. Some, I, I have something that that's so bad happening with me. Um, and I didn't deserve that. And because I didn't deserve that now I have the right to take, Right. Everything oh. is, is mine. I am owed free pass. Uh, you got a free pass now. Somebody, somebody, exactly, slap, somebody exactly. slap me down. I can knock you all over if I want to. Exactly. You might see kleptomania, you know, where, where people are taking things and no, it's not wrong. I'm, I'm entitled to this. You know, I've dealt with my share. I've already been given a bad hand. Everything else is owed to me. Mm-hmm. Okay. Hold um, on. A I'm sorry. I'm actually telling my daughter not to bowl us. <laughs> oh, no, yeah. no but this is the podcast where uh, everybody's okay with that. Um, so, okay. All right. So I understand. All, I I do get that. And so when, so when people come to you or they seek out help in general, they, they're at a point where they're, they or somebody has said to them, your shit's upside down. Like you need help. I don't know how to help you. You're not listening to me. And, you know, I'm people are pointing out maybe this, maybe that, you know, again, mm-hmm. I think maybe well-meaning people are not the best, the are, are not the best equipped to walk you through your psychological minefield. Um, yeah, b- because they they see their perspective and then they layer on top of that, I imagine, all of their problems. So they might be more mirroring themselves onto you than actually seeing you. So your job is sort of to be a blank slate and to not mirror back. And leave your baggage outside and talk to people in a in an academic way about these issues. Is it- um, you know, yes and no. I okay. mean, an academic ways, academic um, perspective is important. But I'm also a human, and part of the sometimes people are looking for connection when they come to therapy. A lot of the time, okay. Um, in fact, that the number one factor that that determines whether or not therapy is going to be successful pe- for people is the rapport they have with their therapist. Sure. So that is a huge factor, the relationship you guys have. And that, that comes from two humans, right? Yeah. Um, you're not talking to a machine, a computer. Um, and so part of it is, yeah, of course I have to, I have to recognize my own biases. That's very, very important for therapy. But, um, 
but I also have experiences, you know, personal experiences. And I also have experiences that with other clients. Um, and so everything you, you, you come to the table with everything you have at your disposal. And then it's about figuring out, um, figuring out what a, what, yeah, what has brought that person to therapy? Um, are they correctly identifying the issues that are, that they're struggling with? Um, and what, what is underlying those, those, um, issues, right? Is it, what's it rooted in? Is it, is it rooted in trauma? Is it rooted in, um, you know, guilt or shame or, or what, are, what are the underlying factors that, that, that are causing them to feel distress or that they're, that are feeling like, um, their life isn't where, where they want it to be right now. Mm-hmm. And so it takes a lot of self-reflection, a lot of exploration. Um, so it's not me just diagnosing, telling them that, that you know, this is the issue and this is what you need to do. It, it, um, it definitely, um, comes from the client, right? So it's, I, I'm helping them with their exploration and so- I'm helping putting words to it. Um, and, and sorting through some of those issues and then, and then getting to the point where, you know, okay, what, what do we need to do about this? Right. And so, yeah. So, so the, the idea of like you, you, you can help them by sharing some of your anecdotes and experiences, as long as they're not colored in a way where, like, I mean, like, uh, something ridiculous, like in the middle of a session, you don't look at somebody and go, I'm very anti-union. You, you know what I mean? Like, like, that, oh, like, no. like, right. Like not personal that way, but just your personal, like. Yeah, I see. I, I do understand. Um, gosh, I was just going to say something, and it fell right out of my head. Um, so it makes me yeah. And self self disclosures in therapy are not not always inappropriate. You know, it, okay. it just depends on the circumstances. Okay. The, the, what, what you have to keep in mind is the session is not about me. This is not about my issues. Sure. Right. It, so so it's only only appropriate if it, if you feel like it's going to help the client. Um, it's all about them. That's their time, and you're trying to help them. Um, help them with whatever whatever needs are, are presenting, and so. Do you think? So, I'm yeah, so, go ahead. I'm sorry. Do you think that it's important for them to realize you're not perfect, or is, or, or do some people need to see you as a, a as a bastion of hope, and some people need to see you as a person? <laughs> yeah, that's kind of a funny question. They, um, no, I think they need to see you as as a human. Okay, absolutely. It's not. You know, I don't even like this. Um, this hierarchy in the, in the therapy session, you know, I don't, I don't put myself above the clients I'm working with. I'm, I'm no better, no worse than they are. Mm-hmm. We're just people. Everybody is people. Everybody has their own issues. You know, nobody is without issues. And, and part of the, uh, part of the way you become a good therapist is by figuring out your own issues. You know, what, what have I done that's worked for me? Um, what strategies have, have helped me overcome challenges and, um, but no, I don't want my clients to see me as being uh, this perfect specimen who doesn't deal with challenges because that wouldn't be um, that wouldn't be helpful to them. Right, um, and, but, and and it's not the truth, you know. Yeah, you know though that people see doctors like that, like using a doctor as an example, which is part of the reason why managing diabetes is sometimes so difficult because you go to this person who's not perfect, who may not understand your diabetes very well, but you believe in your heart that they know. Mm-hmm. And, and then if they say something to you, I mean, one of the things that I see people struggle with most often is they get bad information. They suss it out as bad information, but they keep following it because the person who told it to them in their mind knows more about it than they do. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I do, you know, you do have an expertise and you, I, you have training in psychotherapy. Right. Um, and so absolutely you, you share you share that as needed and um and and um that's very valuable information of course but mm-hmm. um also you, you know psychology is is human connection and understanding and empathy and that con- that plays largely plays out largely in therapy sessions and and is a very effective tool um should I see? And so both, both oh, of I'm those sorry. are very important. No, I, I'm just saying both of those are very important. The academic and the human side. I see. Um, I, I don't think you can do do without either one of those. And in fact, if you were going to dispense with one of those, I would say the academic side is the one to um, go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If I if I go to seek out therapy, should I think of it as surgery or should I think of it as insulin, meaning am I going to need it a little bit every day or is there going to be a time where what you do fixes it and I don't have to think about it again? So that, you know, that totally depends on the client. Some clients, um, 
some clients are, are in therapy multiple times a week, right? Very intensive. Um, it takes work and, and it's draining and, um, and, and the level of support that a, a client needs just depends on their, their level of need. Some clients check in once, once a month, you know, maybe even once every couple of months. Um, and so it, it just depends on the presenting issues and, and where they are in terms of the level of support that they need. Okay. Um, but yeah, effective therapy, it's not, it's generally not a quick fix. You know, it's, um, you're, you're doing a lot of exploration. It's hard work. And, um, and so you really need to have a good connection with the therapist and, um, you need to be willing to, to let your guard down and, and a good therapist helps you do that, you mm -hmm. know, because you have these internal systems, psychological systems that, you know, are designed to prevent you from really looking closely at, at, um, some of these, some of these negative, uh, you know, traumas or, um, experiences that you've had because they can be, um, they can be dangerous to the psyche. And so, um, a good therapist and, and a willing participant, what, what, what you do is you got to lower some of those barriers and get to the, the root of what's going on. I see. I'm, I'm, um, kind of fascinated sometimes, like just like using a hoarder as an example, like, you know, there's, you, you see a television show where someone's packed in a house where they almost can't move with their hoarding junk and garbage, their own feces, like any dead yeah. animals, anything they can have, but yet mm -hmm. they're alive and they're healthy. And I think, wow, we're resilient. Like this person yeah. is fundamentally flawed psychologically and they're still doing it. Like I'm just like, I'm, I'm always like kind of like, it's funny. I think of those things differently. Other people might look and go oh, that poor person. I'm like, Look at how that person is persevering. There's like there, there there are dead cats in a corner. Like there's a dead cat corner in their yeah. house, and they're still like alive and their hair's combed. I'm like, it's insane. It's insane. Yeah. It's insane that we're that that we can be that resilient and yet at times give up so easily over little things. And 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 sometimes I feel like the giving up is a call. It's a cry for help, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And it's funny. That's your, your approach is, is again, very hopeful, very optimistic. You're always seeing the bright side of things, Scott. And mm. I think that that's, that's an awesome attribute. Well, Ben, um, the, the alternative is if you die. So I don't have a lot of options in my, in my opinion yeah, about well, life. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, it, well, some people do take a, a much more negative view of life. They can see a situation and see all the downsides and, and the failures and, um, and everything that's going wrong but, and other people like yourself see the same situation and you're like how can how what can i make of this how do there's I get a lot of good this? things happening here you know you take a strengths approach by this by by, by the same token uh, i'll share with you about myself is i love to complain but i don't mean it in, in a real world scenario like i love i i can when i complain it feels it's joyous. I love to complain about things, but I almost yeah. see it as thinking them through too. Um, and you, you know, like you, you, you blow it up big picture. You, you go, well, here's the problem. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. I can't fix this scenario, but I'll tell you what, yeah. if I ever get put in this situation, I'm not going to do the things I saw go wrong here. I, it feels yeah. like a mental exercise to me complaining. I'm not doing it because I want something fixed and I'm not doing it because I need somebody to hear that I disagree. I just like the exercise of talking about it for some reason. Yeah, it's you're almost um, it's almost like a dream where you're just it's an unstructured and um, you're just letting these thoughts filter through, mm -hmm. and um, and you, you do it with a good sense of humor. And, and I know this about you only because I listen to your your podcast a lot. I, I think you have a lot of those good psychological qualities about you. Um, I think you, you have this kind of relaxed, unstructured style when you're speaking. Um, you're very personable. You, you use sarcasm the right way and it's not, it's not hostile at all. And it's not, um, I don't, I don't detect a lot of, you know, resentfulness. Mm -hmm. Um, it's more like you said, just trying to, um, understand and, and explain things in your own way. Yeah. I, I, I think if this podcast was structured, it wouldn't be any good. Like, or, or at least I'd be the wrong person to host it. You, you know? Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. Like, I just can't, like I, when people talk about like, we're going to make a bullet list and we're going to, I'm like, Oh God, please don't do that. Or, or, you know, they're like, I'm coming on the show. What are we going to talk about? I said, I don't know. We'll figure it out after you say, Hey, my name is Ben. You, you, yeah, you know, like, yeah. like I, I don't want to, because I believe that we probably talked about, we're only 45 minutes into this. 
I believe we probably talked about a dozen things already that never would have come up if I would have run this like right. you would like you would expect it to be run or, or like well, you see it run by other people, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, I think part of that is because you trust the process. Now, now how you got to that point is is of interest to me. And, and I'm sure um, that might be like- narcissism, Ben. <laughs> but but not the bad part of it where I feel like everybody owes me and and yeah. and I I feel like like that part like let me let me imp, like this happened to me let me impose my will on you mm-hmm. I just believe in myself but not you believe blo- in yourself there, yeah and there's there's a, there's a a kind of confidence and and competency there that um you know things are gonna land you're not scared of things going wrong because um well I can tell you why I feel that way. Because, yeah, because because bad things have happened and I'm still alive. Sure. Right. And so uh, we were talking about this the other day in my house. Um, my son just got done college and he's talking about his future. And it's obviously a, a time fraught with, you know, the unknown. And he you can, he's verbalizing and talking it through out loud, which is great. We spent a lot of days since he got home from school just talking about what, what might be. And I realized that the difference between he and I is... I did not grow up with any expectations. Like I didn't think I was going to be happy or financially sound or have a new car or I have no expectations for life. I I have the bar set so incredibly low that no matter what happens, I'm like, look at us winning. You you, you know what I mean? And, 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 and I live through hard things. Like, like I definitely believe in, you know, pressure makes diamonds or whatever you, you know, whatever you want to say there. But yeah. I somebody, I mean, think about it, Ben. When I was a baby, like just born, people who had me were like, eh, nah, you take it. And, and like, and so like you have that knowledge about yourself and then you get, you know, people adopt you. They fight. They're real people. They get divorced, um, you know, and, and that's a hard thing. And then my mom goes off to work to, you know, try to keep us all together. And I'm raising my brothers and they're little and I'm young and that's a hard thing. But to me, every day I open my eyes, I'm still here. I'm like, huh, we're doing it. And so eventually you go through these experiences over and over again. And when you see the next one coming down the street, I'm not scared of it. I'm like, oh, that's this thing. I know what to do about this. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then I just do it. I think I just have more experiences at a young age than most people get. I, I just wasn't. You have a lot, you have a lot of sheltered. experiences, and you have a you have a survivor's mentality, and so you're you're always looking to uh, you you know things are going to be okay at a at, at the core, you know things are are going to land. Yeah, and uh, and Ben, and ben and for clarity, not... really broke as a child, like not like I was sitting in like a seven bedroom house going, oh no, my parents got divorced. What are we ever going to do? I guess we'll use the pile of money my mom got for my. It wasn't like that. Like my mom made four dollars an hour at a terrible job. There was okay. four of us. We only had a place to live because a local church rented us a parsonage that they weren't using. Like I grew up really poor. And and yet I never ever once didn't think I can't do this. I, I and I, I and I dug What's myself out I dug myself out of it. I pulled my brothers along with me. You, you know what I mean? And I and the the best I could. And and I it makes me think of a friend of mine who grew up in a situation, and I, I'm going to keep this very vague because I don't believe this is something they'd want shared, but literally yeah. grew up in a trailer park where they were, were surrounded by really terrible drug abuse and uh, was, I think, one of three kids. And the grandmother scraped up enough money to send one of them to college and literally made the Sophie's choice, right? Picked one of the kids and said, it's you. You're our, you're our hope. Like mm-hmm. you get out of here and come back for us. And, and he did it. Like he wow. went, he became an attorney. He's successful. He bought a home for his, his siblings. He pulled his parents out of it. Like he took that very seriously. And when he and I talk privately, it's fascinating because he's an accomplished person and a very bright man and everything else. But when we talk about our childhoods, it is quite clear that he has enough anger in him to to lay waste to a mountain chain if he needed to. And it's funny because he took that anger and that disappointment and he focused it at something positive instead of going to a bar and getting a little wasted and punching people in the face. Yeah. Yeah. 
you hit the nail. I mean, anger, you know, anger has downsides to it and, and it sure. can be considered a negative emotion and lead you astray, but it can also be a, a really productive fuel source. Mm -hmm. And if you sublimate it in the right way, like your friend did, um, then it, then it can have some really positive and, and great outcomes. You it's know, like you drive. It's like he turned it. Have and say, screw people. I'm a screw in this upbringing or my parents, if they wronged me or whatever my circumstances are, I'm going to use that and show them, you know, right. I'm going to show them that I'm, I'm going to make something of myself. And, and that's awesome that he did that. You know, um, it's like he I, turned I, it into drive. It's almost like he mined anger out of himself and turned it into drive. Like it's the best way I can describe what, what he did. And, and so, so Ben, like if you listen to enough episodes of this podcast and you're really listening, what you're going to see is that I applied the way I think about living to managing diabetes. Mm -hmm. That's really all I did. When you hear me talk, it's why I, I'm enjoying this conversation with you and why I'm having it so other people can hear it. Because if you just take out the the words we used around, you know, life and family and everything and put in bolus and basil and, you know, A1C, I yeah. really just manage diabetes the way I manage my life. It, it, I, I, I try very hard to keep drama out of it. I make sure that I have experiences that I can draw on when I need them. When these bad yeah. things happen, I steal up and and I get through to the next day and I keep going. I, I appreciate good days. I don't expect them. And I, I don't know, like if you're listening to this podcast and you think the way I talk about management of insulin and stuff like that is valuable, all I'm really telling you is about how I went from a little adopted kid to where I am now. I just translated to diabetes. So it's, it's a fantastic mentality that you have a very healthy um, way to, to deal with the world. Um, do you feel like your daughter has picked up some of that from you? She's definitely got the, I don't care part down <laughs> that, that, she, that, that she's got good. She's learning about the management stuff, you know, as it goes. Um, she's had, you know, experiences with diabetes that she can draw on in the future for certain. Um, she's not as good at it as I am, but for the same reasons that that waylay everybody, you know, because she sleeps and I can stay awake if I need to. Because, uh -huh. because, and I think this one's a big one, Ben, because you, generally speaking, care and love your loved ones more than you care about yourself. And, you know, yeah, you, you know, and, and because she's busy living her life and part of my life is managing her diabetes. So yep. she doesn't have that same thing. So we just pass it off slowly. Like I looked years ago, one of the most, and you'll appreciate this as a long time type one and as an adult that as I came up through this and I'd go to speaking events or make podcasts or do whatever I did, adults with type one would always come up to me and say, oh, this is all well and good, but how are you going to teach it to her? And I, I, I and it, that was, I wonder if that's shame. Oh, that's so interesting because they were so, they were so, every time it happened, it, there was anger in the question. I get it online sometimes. I get it in my private life. Yeah, yeah, sure. You figured it out, but you're not going to be able to teach it to her. Because nobody, because I think the unspoken part of that sentence was no one was able to teach it to me, mm -hmm. right? And and I always tell them the same thing. Was, I I take this diabetes thing the same way I think about parenting. You got to say the same thing a million times over and over again without acting like you're irritated by it until you see yeah. them figure it out. And you move on to the next thing and you keep trying to build on top of them until I get so old, I don't care anymore. And then you're on your own, <laughs> you, you know, like, I mean, that's it, Ben, yeah. right? Like. Well, I, th I think you're, what you're doing, you're doing a great service for your daughter because um, she has so much support with you, both talking to her and helping her to manage the diabetes that she doesn't feel alone. And that is one of the one of the major themes I see when I'm working with people with diabetes is they feel alone, alone. because the burden is so high. They don't always have, they're not always so lucky to have parents like you who are so involved with it. So they, your daughter I would imagine does not feel like she is dealing with this by herself sure. and that her dad's got her back and that um, the value in that is, is immeasurable. Well, there's I mean, a lot of luck in it too though, Ben, because I mean, I've, I've interviewed enough people to know that there are some people who, you know, everybody when they're having a baby or their wife's pregnant, you hear, they tell the stories like, you know, one day if something happens, you know, car comes, I'll push them out of the way. I'll jump in front of the car. Then, you know, Ben, the, the, 
the car comes proverbially sometimes and eh, they mm-hmm. pretend like they don't see it. You, you know what I mean? They're like, eh, you know what? The kid can get hit by this one. It's all right. Like, I, yeah. I'm not going to take this one. And, and they're, and they're, so that's sometimes what happens. I just interviewed a, a gentleman the other day. I mean, like, I think seven years old. And the family was like, you'll figure it out. Like, figure it out. Like, he's got nothing figured out. He doesn't know where his Legos are. You're going to put him in yeah. charge of diabetes, you know? And, um, and then the other side of it is, what if your parents are just not intellectually agile enough, mm-hmm. right? Like even if they are, so you could end up with a parent that's not involved and puts it on you. You could end up with a parent who is involved, but is more of a detriment than a help. Or you yeah. might get lucky and have somebody who's interested and understands it. Um, or, you know, corruption. another category is you could get, you get pe- parents who are, you know, they're called helicopter parents. Where they're so involved with everything that they, they basically clear the road of any obstacles and the, the kid never learns to, right. to deal with, um, with challenges on their own. Yeah. That's that how means- you end up with a carbon kid, not a diamond kid. Be- <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Yeah. Right. Be- and so and I didn't so- mean to, I didn't mean to mix science in there, but without the pressure of the carbon anyway, you know what I mean? Yeah. Man. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it, I, I do think that's true too. I, I mean, there have been times like my kids have been hurt playing sports or something bad's happened to them. And, and bless my wife, my wife would, my wife would murder all of you to save my children, as I imagine you would for that, for your children. Yeah. Right. And you know, they, something happened to the kids and she's standing up. I'm like, just like, I put my hand on her. I'm like, just wait, just get you guys. I'm like, they're not dead. And it's right. like, if this was going to kill them, they'd be dead already. So now they're just hurt. So uh-huh. let them be hurt for a minute. Like, let them process the whole thing. And then we'll get to a situation where we'll come in and we'll do what we're supposed to do. But you can't you can't show up before they have an opportunity to to benefit from this bad moment. And And again, if you listen to the podcast, I tell people all the time, when something goes wrong with their insulin, when their blood sugar does something that they don't expect or didn't want, you don't throw your hands up and yell, oh, that's just diabetes. I, I I have no control over this. This thing's terrible. You you use it as an example because until you learn from this example, it's going to have to keep happening until you can figure out, oh, I see this coming. I know how to avoid this. And that's what I thought about like with my kids. Like I actually see talking about insulin like that the same exact way I see letting a kid get hit in the leg in a baseball game and not jumping on the field to check on them right away. Like yeah. you, you need to see this thing through, figure out what it is so that next time you can either avoid it or, or more gracefully get your way through it anyway. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. No, what you're, what you're saying is you use everything as, as a learning experience. Um, and, and I, I couldn't agree more. The thing with diabetes is sometimes there is no rhyme or reason, or at least one that you can identify. Mm-hmm. And so there can be a stressful situation that you can't, you can't, you know, maybe your blood sugars are high or low or yep. something, you know, the insulin hits you the wrong way. Um, and you can't, you don't learn in the sense that next time I'll do things differently. So it's not, it's not about the specific diabetes event, but what you do learn is the perseverance, the resilience is that it's okay that I don't know what caused that. That's going to happen sometimes. Yeah. I also, I'm hoping that I can live with that. And so I, well, you know what? I almost use the word teach and I don't think of myself as a teacher, but I talk about the idea of sometimes it's not important to know why it happened. Just yep. fix it and keep moving. Right. Like, exactly. and, and, and so, and that's a, and I'll tell you, I see people online. There's a great thread in my Facebook group recently where someone was, someone just very lovely. I wish I could find it. Um, they just said like, here's a thing I heard on the podcast that really helped me. What's a thing that you heard on the podcast that helped you? And I kept track of that thread because I was like, well, what am I saying that people are finding valuable? And, uh, you know, maybe there's stuff I'm saying that I'm like, eh, like, maybe I don't have to say that anymore. And maybe it's not striking people. But, but I got to a person who said, exactly what I just talked to you about. One of the things that helps them the most is that they don't need to diagnose every situation and understand it while it's happening, that they can get through it, start over and look at it later if they want to, or just decide it's an anomaly and keep moving. Much in the same way as if I was walking through a mountain trying to get to Montana from New York in the 1800s and and a rock fell next to me, I wouldn't spend the rest of my life thinking a rock fell up was going to fall on my head. I would think, well, that's interesting. And then I would move on. But some people get, some people get trapped in the idea that the rock's going to fall on them. Yeah. That's anxiety, right? Absolutely. Or, uh, you know, it's, um, 
it's feeling that you uh, you sometimes impact more things or have more control over the environment than you do. The same goes if you have a negative interaction with maybe somebody you don't know that well, somebody on the street, right? You might yeah. figure out, you might think, you know, oh, why did this person say such a nasty thing to me? What did I do? What's wrong with me, et cetera? How could I have handled that um, differently? It's uh, or, or what could I do to make sure that I don't cause anything like that again? Well, sometimes some of that is out of your control. So it doesn't help to just keep ruminating about what your role was because you might not figure it out. The important thing is, are you okay? And uh, is it okay that something like that happens? Are you able to get yourself back to baseline and keep moving forward? Ben, is that what's commonly called magical thinking? You, you Magical thinking, yeah. I mean feeling that you're kind of um, more omnipotent than you are. Right. Um, and you, you see this with, with young kids. It's a, it's a very natural phenomenon um, where they, they feel like they have much more power and control over the universe than they actually do. Mm-hmm. And so uh, healthy development is, is learning that, you know, you don't actually bad things happen and they're, they're not your fault. Um, and some things are, you can control certain things and you can't control other things. And, People make their own decisions, et cetera, et cetera. And so that that's um, – so, yeah, there is there, – people always have some magical thinking, of course, and it's helpful through the therapeutic process to identify it um, so that you can kind of accurately think about situations in your life. Yeah, I find that – I always find that very interesting. I tell, I've told a story on here before. I won't bother you with it. It was one time I, I heard, like, if you step on a crack, you break your mother's back. And I was walking yeah. to school one day, and I found myself thinking about it and and – avoiding cracks in the sidewalk. And it took me even, I was in elementary school. It took me about 30 seconds to go, this is stupid. And then I purposely stood on every crack on the way to school I could find, went home and there was my mom and she was okay. And I was like, ah, I knew that was stupid. Uh, You know, like, can you imagine, Ben, can you imagine I get home, my mom's on the floor writhing in pain. She's like, I don't know what happened. My back just kept breaking. (laughs) Yeah, but you know those, and much more common, of course, in childhood, but those superstitions don't go away. There's a a part of our brain, just part of the human brain that, um, that has that going on, you know, that where we are, we are susceptible to those types of superstitions. Um, you, you know, having, you, you know, it's connected to probably a, a religious part of the brain too. Ah, um, but and that's so interesting. I have no religious upbringing and I'm the least superstitious person you'll ever meet in your life. It's superstition. <laughs> it's, it's funny is so far away from how I think. That when uh-huh. I try to use the word in conversation, I can't find it sometimes. Wow. I only knew it just now because you used it first. That's why I went, ah, I'm like, oh, there's that thing that I don't have. Um, ooh, look at me. And I saved all that money and all those Sunday mornings I was able to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel? Does, does that cause you any stress? Um, not because, you know, religion and... Um, Religion, for example, can can bring people a lot of satisfaction and comfort. Yeah. Do you do you find that without that, things are, um, you know, some of those uncertainties about life and death become more stressful for you? I I don't feel stressful about. I, the only thing that bothers me thinking about dying is leaving my children alone. Okay. I I other than that, I don't like. I'm a I'm a pretty happy person. I I love what I do. I love how it helps people. If I walked out in the street today and got hit by a car, my last thought would be, huh, and then that would probably be the end of it. So, okay. um, you know, I, I I know I'm going to die. Um, I'm okay with that as near as I I'm sure as I get closer to it, I'll get less, you know, okay with it. But but yeah. I don't feel like it's coming today. The passage of time bothers me in that I think about it. You know, um, but it's the measurement stuff. It's your It's your kid graduating from something or – you know, you look back and you're like, oh, wow, we built this thing 10 years ago or, or you throw something away and you think, God, when did we buy that? Or, you know, I, I saw a sweatshirt that my wife and I used to share when she was in college and it's gone. And it made me sad that the sweatshirt was gone. But I stopped thinking about it about eight seconds after that. Um, you it, know, it I sounds just, like your, your family and raising kids is is the absolute most important thing to you. It's the only thing I care about. And um not the only thing, but it's it's the thing I th- I care about most. I, I will tell you that very recently, you know, we were having a conversation just about my uh, my wife's four hundred one k plan. I have a podcast, so 
obviously Ben, I don't have a 401k plan, but, um, but we were talking about my wife's and we were going to move it to another management place. Like it was just sitting somewhere. She had had an old job and we were going to move. This is a common thing that happens. Like you leave a job, you leave a 401k behind. We were going to move it over to somewhere else. So we're talking okay. to the person who's going to move it. And he says to me, what do you want to do when you retire? And I didn't answer him with what I thought because I thought I sounded ridiculous. And, and so I, what I said to him instead was, was like, I really don't know. Like I think of myself as what I do. I do what I do because it helps people because I enjoy it. It helps my family. Uh, it pays my bills and, um, I like it. And so I do that thing. And moreover, I see myself as a tool that makes money so that my family can thrive. And I, okay. and I haven't thought about what I would do if I didn't have to do those things or who I would be. But the truth is, Ben, that's the answer I gave him. The truth is, when he said it, I thought, I want to watch my son play baseball. It's the only thing I could think of. It'll make me cry now, Ben, if we start talking about it. <laughs> and yeah. so um, it was the only thing that really popped into my head. He said, what do you want to do when you retire? And I thought, I want to go to a field and I want to watch my son play baseball. It's the only thing I could think of. So it's, it's so important for you to be there for your kids because probably ha having to do with your, you, you being adopted at a young age, you be, you know, the comment you made earlier when I we assume, were talking yeah. about being in a way, you know, I can tell there was a little bit of hostility there, um, you know, with, maybe I'm misinterpreting it, but that's what it sounded like to me, a little bit of anger there. And you, I think you kind of probably made a commitment somewhere along the way that, you know, I will never abandon my family. I will be there for them, you know, through the, through the thick and thin of life. And that, that is my meaning. That is my purpose. And I will never do anything close to what was done to me. Yeah. So much. So I'm aware of all this, Ben, but I appreciate it. Cause I think you're right. Um, I appreciate it. Cause I, I appreciate it, Ben, cause you agree with me, but, um, <laughs> But I, I believe you're right. And but when I was younger, in my 20s and 30s, um, I could not stand it if my family members fought with each other because I linked fighting with divorce. Yeah. And so if people disagreed, it was incredibly important to me that they they did not walk away from the conversation angry. And it took me a long time to realize that that's not how things work. Um, yeah. and, and I, I've given that away too. Like you can't mediate everything and that right. sometimes people's feelings overwhelm their common sense. Actually, most of the times their feelings overwhelm their common sense. Um, and so it, it I've, I've gotten very good at letting personal drama play out and, and, and paying attention to when it's ready, like when they're ready to find their resolution and not try to force a resolution. Um, I wonder if, you know, you have this part of your personality that's very, uh, very personable and very uh, calm. I can see you being very calm in stressful situations and, and mending things over and um, kind of being the bridge builder, perhaps, you know, between two fighting parties. You kind of give, give me that, that sense when I talk with you. And I wonder if part of that has developed um, you know, you know, over the course of your life because, because you you need to make sure that the family doesn't split apart. You know that that is your role, right, you know, Ben? Your, yeah, yeah. Because when it when it goes the other way, your mom cries a lot. That's why. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, <laughs> that's not good either. Yeah, right. So it's just you know it's uh it really is that, and it's funny. Like if I th if I saw my family as a dysfunctional thing that would be better off without each other, I can't honestly tell you that I would force it together. Mm -hmm. I just don't, I just, I think luckily enough, I don't see them that way. And so it, it seems to me, you know, little problems that come up day to day and stuff like that, that are not the kind of things you throw away a family over or you throw away a relationship over. So, I mean, even, even being married, like it's, you, you're pretty young, right? I am 34. And I heard a baby earlier. Did I not? You did, yeah. yeah okay. Two little kids. Okay. Yeah, three, three year old and a one year old. I, I thought earlier I either heard a baby or somebody was running an electric drill. I couldn't tell which it was at first, and I thought it's probably a baby. Uh, so um, yeah, that was probably my one year old. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Adorable. Congratulations. That's that's thank wonderful. you. Yeah. Uh, but but the idea of like you don't know yet. Like you know from talking to people, so you have a better idea than most people. But being married for a lifetime is incredibly difficult. And yeah. and the way I approach it is that I don't expect it all to be perfect. 
you know, I, I said to my wife one time, I was like, if we're married for 40 years one day and 10 of the years were amazing and 10 of them were terrible and five of them were okay and eight of them were not so bad. And, you know, there was that one year where we probably didn't talk to each other. Like, if that's what it is at the end, that seems like a pretty big success to me. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. But and you- marriage is not all, you know, sunshine. I mean, it's, it's, it's more than just romance. It's uh it's a friendship, it's a partnership, and there's ups and downs all the time. Right. Uh, and so you kind of have to weather the storm um, and and cherish the, the times when everything's going well. I think there's times that you have to have a macro view and there's times you have to have a micro view. And you know, if someone's hitting you, that's micro view time. Like this yeah. is not okay, it has to stop. But if you're just arguing about wanting to spend money on something or not having money or something like that. And this argument lasts for a couple of weeks or something like that. You have to step back macro and say, if I'm going to be married 40 years, these last two weeks are meaningless you Yeah, know, in the grand scheme of things. It's almost the way you think about your life on the planet and time and stuff like that. Like my life is incredibly important to me and the people who love me. And beyond that, it's fairly meaningless to everything else, you, you know, and I find some comfort in that. And whereas I think other people find that to be a scary thought, but I don't. Yeah. Well, I think you're, you're expanding your, your reach, especially with this podcast. I think you're impacting a lot of people, um, in, in a really positive way. Uh, people who, people who, uh, have diabetes, people who want to learn more about diabetes, yeah. people who are just interested in a good conversation. Um, I think I you, so. you, yeah, yeah I, I think you have a great podcast and, um, you're, you're right. You do have to look at, and some people get uncomfortable with feeling too insignificant, you know, in, in uh, and in the grand scheme of things, when you look at the universe, we are pretty insignificant, you know? I, so I it's think it's comforting, Ben. It means if I screw something up, it's not really that bad. You, yeah. you, know, you know what I mean? Like, you know, I, just even the weirdest stuff. We planted eight bushes one time and one of them died. And I was like, huh, only one of them died. That's great. And I know yeah. my neighbor was like, can you believe that bush died? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I can. Uh, I'm full for you. Yeah. Like I, to me, I was like, wow, only one. That's terrific. And, and he was like, oh, now you got to replace it. And I was like, yeah, but only one died. That's good. I am. Yeah. So anyway, Ben, I'm not going to hold any. We're over our time and I apologize. Uh, no, but, oh, no, not at all. But I want to I, I just want to say if anyone's still listening, first of all, you're a great fan. Thank you for listening to the end. I always appreciate that. And secondly, everything that I've brought up today Just listen to it and then apply it to your life with diabetes and things will get easier. It just, it, it's all right there. Ben, uh, avoid drama, um, understand what moments are important, what moments aren't important, you know, safety overall, keep the family together, you know, like that kind of stuff. Like it all, it all leads to fairly good success. And in my mind, a life that's unencumbered day to day for the most part, which I think is like my goal. My goal is just that for most of my days to be good. Yeah. You know? And I think you do that very well by sticking to your, your ethics and your values and, um, and uh, feeling like you're, you're contributing in a meaningful way to, to the world. Ben, do you want to hear my ethics? When I was younger, I used to tell people, people were like, how do you run your life? And I said, uh, I never lie if I don't have to. And I try to treat people the way I want to be treated. Those were, my, those were only my only two rules growing up. That was that's fantastic. That was it, Ben. What are your rules? What do you what what what's the line you won't cross? Oh, that's tough. I that's, know, uh, but I'm putting you on the spot. Yeah, um, you know, I think be, I think I'd have to say you have to be honest with yourself, and maybe that's my psychology brain talking. Mm-hmm. But um, I think, you, I think you, if things are not going well in your life, you have to look at things through an honest lens and ask yourself why. And, um, and, you know, live by your values, the things that are important to you being, um, being straight with people, uh, being honest to you. I know I keep saying, be honest to yourself. I think that's such an important thing because I see all the time with other people and with myself at times that there's a lot of deception when you have these conversations with yourself, Mm -hmm. you know, you're not, you're not being real. You're kind of hiding, um, hiding maybe some underlying reasons for why you're doing what you're doing. And so if you have a, have a good relationship with yourself and you're, you're not scared to um, look inside yourself, then I think that can have some really um, positive and productive results. And so that's, yeah. that's what I always try to do. Ben, if you're lying to yourself, there's no way you're going to have success with anything. 
Exactly. It's, just, it's I, I heard exactly. a comedian say one time, um, I God, I wish I could remember her name. She was so funny. She said, I went on that Weight Watchers where you write down all your calories. And one day I had a pie and wrote down that I had cashews. I'm the only one that sees the list, she said. And and I that was such an insight to people. Like like yeah. you, no one sees this but you. What does it matter what you write down here? You're, she's literally lying to herself. Yeah. And, and yeah, just to get over right, like it, it gets you through. Like it's the difference between it's it's the difference between just getting to the next day and the next day actually being what I'll tell you I'm gonna finish my thought with a statement, but one of the things I, I detest most in life is when you and I are in a room together, Ben, and um, I lie to you, you know I'm lying, and I know you know I'm lying, and none of us stop lying. I find that to be maybe the most maddening of of human interactions, and it feels like a waste of time. It insults the amount of life I have, and I can't fathom why everyone is lying when everyone knows the truth. If it, 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 it's, it's absolutely maddening to me. Um, is that a common thing that people do, though? Uh, you mean like for both parties to be sitting there and lying or yeah. not acknowledging the elephant in the room? It's basically lying to yourself, but in a, in a family or a group situation. Yeah, that, yeah, it happens all the time. It happens in, in large ways and small ways. Um, sometimes you don't even know. It's not always conscious. You know, you don't know you're lying to yourself. Right. Um, you know, and it takes, it takes a lot of work and a lot of self-exploration to, to, to figure out, um, why you keep telling yourself like a narrative, for example, Mm -hmm. about your life or about the way things are, you know, a certain set of circumstances that you're in. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you keep telling yourself these little stories all the time, these voices in your head all the time and, and they're on repeat and, um, and, and you have to question them. You know, you have to say, wait a minute, is this, is this real? Is this, uh, am I being honest with myself? And, and, and if not, why not? You know, what's being covered up here? And, uh, but you know, it has to start from a place of, of recognizing that you don't like where you are. Right. You know, I, I need to change something. I, I, I'm not satisfied where I am and, and I want things to be better. Can it and help? I'm sorry. I cut you off. I didn't mean to. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Can it help you if you're in a in a financially depressed situation, um, or you just don't have a lot of resources? Can it help to make tiny changes, the ones you can affect? Is that a thing that can build for you to bigger things? Do, are you saying financially distressed because you're saying if you like can't afford a therapist? If yeah, if you can't, well, listen, if you can't afford a therapist, or if you can't even afford to dream that things are going to go well, I guess is what I'm talking about. Like if I get up every day to go make French fries at a place. And I hate that, but this is the best job I can get. Is yeah. there still something smaller in my life more in, that might seem inconsequential, but if I made a, a positive change to it, I might get a, I might get that boulder rolling down a hill. Yeah. I mean, you know, one, one thing that people do is um, even, even when you're in a really uh, a negative situation, identifying things that are going well for you. And it sounds like that's something, Scott, that you do all, all the time for yourself, which, mm-hmm. is, which, like I said before, I think is really, really useful and valuable. Um, so, so you're identifying the things, even if uh, there, there are a few, um, that are going well for you in your life and, and identifying where you want to go, you know, what, what, what do you want to accomplish, um, whether it be with your work or your family or some other situation in your life, and, and evaluating are, the, are these realistic goals and what are the what are the steps I need to take to get there? Um, you know, doing doing the self exploration, depending on the person, can be very challenging without without somebody else there. It doesn't necessarily have to be a therapist, but you want to have a trusted individual to talk about things. Yeah. Um, well, so that you can well, that's a thought. that's a good place yeah, go to leave it, Ben. Like, so you're in. Like, so I, I don't know if you've heard. Like, I, I Erica comes on a lot. She's a a licensed uh, family, something I forget what Ella. Yeah, I forget, yeah. yeah, you know what I mean. Um, and but she's from California, and she can only see people. It, it's a weird thing. Like your industry is opened up to online, but it's bordered by state. So, yeah. what state are you in? I'm in Illinois. Okay. How people? How could people find you? So um, right now, the best way to find me would be on Psychology Today. Okay. I am in the process of working on a website. Um, 
which I'm, I'm finding is much more difficult than I thought it would be. So <laughs> Squarespace.com, <laughs> Ben, you can do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, have, I have new respect for these web designers. Um, it's not as easy as I thought it would be, but I'm in the process of working on a website, but the best way to contact me would be, um, or to find me, learn more about me would be on psychology today. You just type in my last or, or my full name, Ben Shabad, S H A B A D. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's got my contact information there. Um, and so that would, that would be a good place to start. Well, I, um, I must have liked you because I let you say that in the recording. So uh, <laughs> I had a really good time talking today. Thank you very much. I, I know I talked more, but uh, if I don't like present my problems, how are you going to give context to them? So, yeah, uh, yeah. No, I thought uh, this, this was a great time meeting with you. I really appreciate you having me on the show. Um, like I said, I, I love your podcast. And, you. um, and, I, and I think it does a lot of good. So thanks a lot. I appreciate it very much, Ben. A huge thank you to one of today's sponsors, Gvoke Glucagon. Find out more about Gvoke Hypopen at gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. You spell that G V O K E G L U C A G O N dot com forward slash juice box. I'd also like to thank AG1 from Athletic Greens. And tell you about that link again, athleticgreens.com forward slash juice box. You get your order plus five free travel packs plus the vitamin D. Head over there now. And of course, don't forget about touchbytype1.org and t1dexchange.com forward slash juice box. Thank you so much for listening. I'll be back very soon with another episode of the Juice Box Podcast. If you're not subscribed or following in a podcast app, I would really appreciate it if you did. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music are some of the most popular. You should not be paying for a podcast app. They should be free. And it really helps when you subscribe and follow and tell someone else about the show.